And John Lee has a lot of Dharma talks where he portrays the practice as a development of skills. He makes a lot of analogies with manual skills, sewing a pair of pants, weaving a basket, making clay tiles. We take those images in, adopt that approach, and sometimes we can get too grim about it. We read books that say that to get really good at a particular topic, you have to devote 10,000 hours of practice time. And so we very intuitively put in our 10,000 hours. As if a simple amount of time would be enough. And if we get grim about it, we're missing an important part of concentration practice, which is that it has to be based on a sense of gladness, a sense of ease, finding enjoyment in being right here. Remember the stages in focusing on the mind. First you're sensitive to the state of your mind, and then, and then you gladden it. You can gladden it by thinking about the good you've done in the past about how fortunate you are to be here, having this opportunity to work directly on your mind. But sometimes gladness has to come with a sense that you're enjoying doing this. So you get rid of the grim attitude, remind yourself, a lot of learning a skill is learning how to play. Now, some people say who want to get good at a guitar, so they hire an expert teacher, and the expert teacher gives them exercises and demands X number of hours of practice every week. But then there are the kids who learn guitar by just getting a guitar, going into the bedroom, shutting the door, and playing around. Trying out this, trying out that, using their ingenuity. And gradually they get a sense of what works, what doesn't work. And the fact that they're exploring on their own, that this is their time just to play, lends a lot of joy, even when things don't come out well. I've been reading recently about a Norwegian physicist who did a lot of early work on electromagnetism, and he was playing with his toys. He had some disastrous results. One time he was going to show a new solenoid gun to a large group of people, assured them that it would be safe, they wouldn't hear anything except for this, the bullet reaching the target. He turned it on, this huge arc of electricity went waving through the room, scared everybody. They all went running out. He became famous in a way that he didn't expect, but he laughed it off. After all, electricity was something we're still exploring. So when you're sitting here, you've got the body, you've got your mind, you've got name in the sense of mental events, simply on the level of being mental events. You've got the body in the sense of the four elements. Okay, play with those things. Play with the breath. You read John Lee's instructions on how to play with the breath, and you can follow them. But you can also do them backwards. Where he says to have the breath go down, you can think of it going up, or vice versa. Or you can simply ask yourself, what would it be a fun way to breathe right now? What would be a fun way to perceive or picture the breath to yourself? Try it out. See what you can do with it. Remember the principle of comedy improv. Never say no to a new idea. Explore it. It may turn out that it's not a good idea, but you won't really know until you've explored it. In this way, the meditation becomes a process of discovery. It's your meditation, particularly when you play with the perceptions. You can ask yourself, where are you in the body? And that was one of Dogen's questions when he was teaching de-thinking thinking. Is the body sitting in the mind, or is the mind sitting in the body? Where is your mind in the body? We tend to think of our awareness as being focused in the head, but there's an awareness of the hand in the hand, of the foot in the foot, of the leg in the leg. 
let them have a little bit of their own freedom. See if you can center your awareness there. Because all of John Lee's instructions for the breath came from playing around. The questions he would ask, if something seems true, to what extent is its opposite true? That's playing around with ideas. The questions that Ajahn Mahabhu asked about pain, is the pain the same thing as the body? Does it have an intention? He was playing around with different questions to see what might help as he was sitting with pain. And the fact that he was playing around, again, made it an adventure, something fun to do. So you've got your toys right here. In fact, that's an image that a John Lee uses. Four big dolls to play with, he says, the four elements. How do you play with earth? How do you play with water? How do you play with a fire element inside the body? How do you play with a breath? There are no shoulds there. That's what makes the exploration fun. Now you will find that sometimes you try something out and it doesn't work. I've had times when I've tried to work through some tightness in my spine and give myself a headache by forcing things too much. And chalk that up to experience. And John Fung had a lot of students who, as they would meditate, start get, would start getting large feelings of intense pressure in the chest. He would have them think of the, the pressure going out the arms, down through the arms, out through the palms of the hands. There's pressure in the head, think of it going out the eyes. If that doesn't work, get up, walk around for a bit, so things get back to normal. And then get back to play. Think of the meditation not as a chore or as a duty that you have to do. It's op your opportunity to play with name and form. Because it's dealing on this level that you get very close to understanding where, where your ignorance is. And you see the potentials of name and form. That's how you develop knowledge, knowledge that you explored on your own. When a John Fung would teach, even though the book he would hand out to people mentioned the four jhanas and actually described them quite well, and John Lee's Keeping the Breath and Mind method too, still he never talked about jhana. He would never tell his students which jhana they were in when they would have a meditation and things seemed to settle down well. He would ask them, how would you describe the breath? How would you describe the state of your mind? We would have them take an interest in what they directly experienced without having to measure it against some standard on a chalkboard. Now, he may have seen the John Lee teaching other people. Now, when John Lee was first teaching in Bangkok, he had to emphasize jhana because the party line there among the scholarly monks was that the age of jhana was past, the age, of course, of nirvana was past. Monks should be helping in the schools. And so John Lee had to prove that that was not true. One of his ways of doing it, again, was playing around. There was an old woman who had a job of cleaning the restrooms in the monastery where he was teaching. She would come and meditate with him, and she got so that she could read minds. So the first thing she did was to read the minds of the monks in the monastery. And she got really incensed, and she went and told on them to the abbot, Do you realize what this monk is thinking and what that monk is thinking? And the abbot, knowing the monks, knew that she was probably right. He called the monks together and said, Okay, you guys have to watch out. These people can read you inside and out. Put the fear of John in them. Now, the drawback was that some of the John Lee students would start comparing their Johnas with one another. 
And I even saw that a little bit with the John Fuang students. So to avoid that, the John Fuang would not talk in those terms. Simply have them know what were you doing, and what did it feel like as a result. And then he would let them out to play. So as you're sitting here meditating, think of yourself being at play. At play with the four elements of the body. At play with feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, consciousness, your awareness. On those basic building block terms. And you begin to see even how not only are your perceptions somewhat arbitrary, but even the Buddhist perceptions are conventions. You see this in some of the John's teachings. The teachings on three characteristics, three perceptions, in constant stressful, not self. You'll notice a couple of John's will talk about, well, what is constant? What is not stressful? What is under your control? John Cha talks about how dependently co-arisen phenomena are in constant stressful, not self, but the process of dependent co-arising, that's constant. That keeps on going. And John Lee would talk about how getting the mind into concentration fights against those three characteristics. Gaining insight, and again, just looking into what in the mind is constant in addition to what is inconstant. What is stressful, what is easeful, what is under your control, what is not under, under your control. They just say, then you have to take all those insights and you have to let go of them too. So they took the Buddha's teachings as a challenge. Can you prove him wrong? And even then when they found that there were some things that had their constant aspect, even they had to be let go of, which was a good warning. Even when you see a truth that is true all the way through, you can't hold on to it. You have to take a playful attitude there as well. No, you can let go with a light touch. So when the meditation begins to get tedious, remind yourself, you're here to play. You've got a whole hour to be at play. Focus on having a good time, and you'll find that you gain knowledge painlessly, even in the midst of physical pain. The mind can have a good time.